Hello there everyone, I'm Mr. Mocha Lover and thank you for joining me here in Tiano, the last days of Europe, in which we are going to explore the Idel Ural Free State. Though their numbers may be depleted, the minorities of the steppes have survived. They've hidden in basements, forests, and caves, desperately trying to pass as Russian as the death squads pass by, and forged papers to escape Taborski's Shtumorviki. But they've been freed by the collapse of the region's nightmare state, joining forces in the hope of staving off further destruction. Their intense persecution and enslavement has left them bitter, bitter towards great Russians, despite knowing that all peoples have suffered under Daddy Tabby. Spurning contact with the rest of Russia, they will form an isolationist pluralist ethnostate where ethnic great Russians are encouraged to reject their old identities and assimilate into a more moral ethnicity. No half measure shall be taken to guard their new free state for potential oppressors, for the corpse of the empire is still on the border, and Larionov, of course, still lurks. <clears throat> and we're led by a room with portraits in it. If you'd like to read about the Joint Council of the Free Peoples, please, please, please go right ahead, but it is what it is. Breakout to the Volga, Azure and Serpentine. It's August wind waters imbuing the serene land alongside it with everlasting life and fertility. The farms and settlements of the Tatars had once been nestled upon this soil, tranquil and undisturbed, calm and idyllic. This old has been shattered, though. An all encompassing eclipse had engulfed Tatarstan's verdant fields in Cimmerian darkness. This, however, was not meant to last, for the eclipse would eventually subside. The rapidly retreating penumbra had left behind several vestiges of their presence and symbols of the abhorrent suffering they had brought upon these lands. To many, they were rallying points for retribution. A resentful tempest of jagged daggers and deafening gunfire descended upon the Russian Sturmoviki guards of the slave outposts, frightened and stupefied. Unintelligible shouts and cries brimming with rage and indignation accompanied the screams of fear as sharp steel viciously cut into the flesh of petrified Russian guards, tattering their woolen uniforms covered in fresh stains of crimson, bursts of white. Hazy smoke permeated into the air as Tatar firearms emptied their loads in the back. Of fleeing men, the copper plated bullets lodging themselves within various body parts with infallible precision. Pleads for mercy were met with the distinctive crackles of a pistol, their bodies lifelessly collapsing onto the ground. As any semblance of opposition began to dissipate within the camp, the assailants turned their attention towards the liberation of the countrymen, rendered slaves by the Stromoviki. They were unbound by their shackles and released from their fetters. Hundreds upon hundreds returned to their homes alongside their liberators, free men once more, the remnants of the site, as a final act of vengeance, were set alight. From afar, the camp engulfed in flames stood as a fiery brazier, a symbol and a warning of the resilience of the Tata people. Blood in the water with a nice little horse picture down there, but let's see, political laws, military laws, the death of some dude, and with the national spirits, bitter survivors, that's nice, plus 30% division defense on core territory, and a tasty, tasty salted earth. Hmm. Can I get some fries with that? The hardest thing of all. The remnants of Kazan, smoldering and dilapidated, its streets, factories, and tenements, reduced to nothing more than rubble to many, the city resting upon the banks of the Volga, the city of opulent mosques and cathedrals alike was now nothing more than an accumulation of ash and bricks destined to suffer through the centuries as a reminder of the tragedies that had befallen Russia. To others, however, it served as a rationale for perseverance, a reason to endure and rebuild, to emerge from the debris and glorious triumph and prosperity. A council of steadfast Tatars gathered in a chamber, all of them irking to speak and share their opinions. This was a governing body of the newly proclaimed Idel Ural Free State, an assembly comprised of peoples once oppressed and persecuted under the regimes of old. Within minutes, the council was engaged in fierce debates upon the matters of Russians and their territory, and the people that were responsible for the current state of sorrow and agony. Expulsion! These men have brought enough suffering upon our people, allowing them to remain would be a travesty, a voice shouted across the room in rage followed by a series of cheers. By expelling them, all we would be doing is repeating the methods that they have employed. We would be no better. A equally rambunctious voice cried out. The discord and discussion proceeded for hours, with the voices of different figures dominating the room at different moments. Despite the frenzy of emotions, however, no common consensus was reached. The Russians of Kazan would be allowed to remain. For now. That mercy I to others show. That mercy show to me. Economic laws, coal trinket minimum wage, low unemployment. I've got some police. Affirmative action for minorities. Women in the workplace. Outlawed. Incarceration. Public education. Okay. Very few or few pollution regulations, but lessons lost. Oh, uh, you can have whatever. We don't care. When the ideal Ural Free State was given life amid the shadowy maelstorm that became the Holy Russian Empire, Anvar had felt only a slimmer of relief when the freedom that came with the territory 
despite no longer needing to hide in secret cellars and chambers from the prowling Stumoviki jackals, despite no longer having to live by the mandate of fear settled end of policy, by that madman and his perfidious cult of whispering snakes, he did not feel the sweet essence of relief. Washing down his burdened soul, yes, he and his people, the Tatas, have been given freedom amid the apocalypse of Tabaritsky, but now they must face a new, greater challenge. They were not free, but now they must heal and recover. Anvar was no doctor, but he was an academic in a different field, that being the teaching of his people's rich culture to a new generation so that they may in turn share to their descendants for as long as time shall last. Daddy Tabby saw that all of the peoples he deemed inferior to his greater Russians were to be eradicated from the annals of history, this his history. The scholar had witnessed himself the cruelty that had been inflicted upon his people's great works and memorable texts. The Shtumoviki proving meticulous in incinerating and shredding all matters of scripture that so much as oozed degeneracy, the smell of burning paper still haunted his senses, even as a cold year old breeze surged into his lungs as he remained stood before the husk of an old burned school, the stench of the ignorance serving as his scar from that ghastly regime. Thankfully, some of the most important knowledge has been persevered or preserved in his aging mind. But it was just one illiterate man amid a sea of broken, illiterate souls within the village he called home. Most of the words, words barely had an understanding of the basic history of the Tata, barely adjusted to the general teachings. To make it worse, almost all of his peers were survivors of these horrid death camps, their minds forever hijacked by the ghastly sights that they witnessed within those fenced compounds of misery and agony. It barely left enough space for such younglings to build even the motivation to study. Slowly, he brought himself to sit down upon the front steps of the school, his shoulders forever burdened with the arduous task of salvaging a history torn to shreds and cast to the winds of fate. For as much as he was wise and filled with knowledge, there was no plausible solution to rebuilding what was now forever lost. All he could truly do was ponder and weep. Woe to the one who casts his past to the abyss. Let's see, so we're improving our literacy. We're improving our equipment, which is not bad. Anything regarding research facilities? Nope. Agriculture, nope. Poverty is slowly going up, not too much, but as well as industrial expertise. Army professionalism and nuclear stockpile, not so much, but night terrors. Oh boy. For the start, Aliyah woke, gasping for breath as though she had forgotten how to breathe. She looked around her, but only found the familiarly unfamiliar people who shared the communal housing with her. Only one of a number of similar places for those with no family, no home to return to. There were no Stromoviki to be seen, and yet they could not be unseen. They were gone, that was certain, but not forgotten, many years from being forgotten, if they ever could be. She had been but a girl when she had been sent to one of Taborutsky's camps, and now. She was a young woman, left without anything in the world except for the identity the Stromoviki had tried to eradicate her for. Being a Tata had cost her everything, and now it was all she had, standing up carefully so as to not wake the others in the room. She walked over to the door to the room and leaned against it, clasping her hands together in silent prayer. There, she took several deep breaths and re-examined her surroundings. The camp was gone. The guards were gone. She was here. Nobody here wanted to harm her. Slowly but surely, the nightmare she had been having began to fade. It would return, if not the next night, then another, but for now she could feel safe, successfully back into the present. Aliyah began to return to where she was meant to sleep, but as soon as she took a step forward, she realized something. Others in the room were groaning, tossing, and turning in their sleep, helpless against the unseen terrors. Nightmares of the camps plagued them just as they did her. May Allah help us all, Aliyah pleaded with a whisper. The camp causes suffering long after it is gone. But happy 1974, everyone. Hope you're having a good year, unlike Aliyah. That we just talked about. Quite authoritarian democratic, huh? 100%. And... War of Vengeance, are you ready, Rustem? After a few more moments of looking over, the supplies they had decided to bring with them, not too much, but they would suffice, Rustem replied to his older brother, Murtaza, who stood by and said, As ready as I'll ever be, and you? Murtaza chuckled, but there was no humor in it. I'm more ready for them than they are for us. Dudes won't even know what hit them. Without another word, Rustem pulled the bag onto his back, the handle going over his shoulder. And like that, the pair of Bashkir brothers left in their native village, setting out, settling out in the wastes. Nobody waved or said goodbye to them. Who was left to do so? Nobody remained there save world-weary men, who felt much older than they were and tired women who just wanted to live normal lives again. Even so, there was no such thing as a normal life in their homeland anymore, not after the thrice darned Strumoviki had slaughtered their way through their people, placing them in camps and treating them like rats needing extermination. Not after their once beautiful lands they called, them, called home lay ruined, poisoned by countless toxic chemicals, their people could try to rebuild all they wanted in this new state just for them. But Rostem and Murtaza knew that there was no going back now, especially not for them, having lost all their friends and family except each other. They could not bear to see the remains and that they had ignited a flame within them. One which would not stop burning until it reduced every last remaining Strumoviki to ash. The future is for those with something to lose. They have nothing. We go to war with the purification zone? Alright everyone. So, even though we've won the war against the uh, Euro purification zone, 
there's still nothing here left for us, but uh, that's unfortunate. Oh well, if you enjoyed the little video, consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow in another video. Thanks for watching, have a great rest of your day.